Hello, and thank you for joining us for this keynote talk on the deployment of Bloom, a 176 billion parameter multilingual large language model. My name is Sanjit Gandhi, and I'm a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face. Hi, and I'm Suraj. I'm also a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face. We both work in the open source team at Hugging Face on popular projects such as Transformers, Diffusers, and Big Science. Before we jump into the specifics of the Bloom model, it's worth acknowledging the wider project that it forms part of. Big Science is a one-year project that seeks to train the largest multilingual language model to date. What's unique about Big Science is its fully collaborative, open source and open science approach. Fundamentally, Big Science wants to change the way in which we approach large language model training by pushing for the creation of large-scale artifacts that can be used by the research community. In that spirit, Big Science involved over 1,000 researchers from 60 different countries and 250 institutions. The heat map in the bottom right shows the distribution of contribution. It's safe to say that Big Science is a truly global effort. The two deliverables of the Big Science project were a very large multilingual text corpus and a very large multilingual language model. The global community involved in the Big Science project contributed their own languages and data to the text corpus. For that reason, we see the inclusion of 46 different languages and code into this multilingual corpus, including several languages from low resource settings. This corpus was then used to train the Bloom model, which we'll now get into. To understand Bloom, we first need to understand what, langu what language models are. First, we define a prompt that we feed into the language model, shown here on the far left. The language model, highlighted in blue, takes the prompt and computes the probability of the next word conditioned on the prompt. It then outputs a word based on the computed probabilities. We can generate a string of outputs by recursively feeding the language model outputs back into the inputs. Once the first model output is generated, we append it to the prompt input and then rerun a forward pass. The model then generates a new token, in this case, robot, which we again append to the prompt input. We then rerun a forward for pass and repeating this process, we can generate sentences of arbitrary length. Language models have a, have a wide variety of use cases, most notably in question answering and autocomplete. Because of the multilingual nature of the Blue model, we can also use it to autocomplete code. Now onto the Blue model. So Bloom stands for Big Science Large Open Source Open Access Multilingual Large Language Model. It's a transformer decoder based architecture similar to GPT. It has the same number of parameters as GPT-3 or 117 times more than GPT-2 and 1,600 times more than the common BERT base architecture. It's trained on 1.5 terabytes of text data for more than 1.5 million A100 GPU hours. Bloom is able to generate text in 46 natural languages and 13 programming languages. For almost all of them, including Spanish and French, Bloom is the first language model with over 100 billion parameters. What's unique about the Bloom model is the fact that it's been open sourced and is open access. And it's this last point which is particularly cool. The Blue model has been released into the Hugging Face ecosystem, meaning the community can use, load, and play with the Blue model in just several lines of code. This is a really big facilitator for anyone in the research community doing their own research and having such a big language model at their disposal. This is something that was not previously possible. However, the sheer size of Bloom presents its own challenges. Most notably, the parameters of Bloom require 300 gi 350 gigabytes of storage alone. And this is, in, this is in B float 16 or half precision. If we compare this to the capacity of some standard hardware accelerators, such as a V100 GPU, an A100 GPU, or a single TPU core, we see that we have a bit of a problem. The model parameters themselves exceed the memory capacity of the hardware devices. This means that when we try and load our model onto our device, we're going to get an out of memory error. 
And this is before we've tried loading any data and performing a forward or backward pass. In such circumstances, where a model cannot fit onto one device, we have to employ a form of model parallelism. Rather than limiting ourselves to one device, we can take multiple accelerator devices, such as multiple TPU cores, and parallelize our model across these devices. This circumvents the issue of an out-of-memory issue as we combine the collective memory of our hardware devices. The first form of parallelism that we're going to discuss is data parallelism. Essentially, what we do here is take our model and replicate it across our hardware devices. Here, we're not actually changing the structure of the model, but rather copying our model across devices. What we then do is send a different batch of data to each device. Essentially, then, we, have our, we run a forward pass in parallel, but on different batches of data. We use this to accelerate inference speed. Our second form of parallelism is model parallelism. And this is specifically for models that don't fit onto the memory of one device. There are two forms of model parallelism. First, pipeline parallelism, where we split one or several consecutive layers of the model over a single device. And our second form of parallelism is tensor parallelism. So instead of having each tensor on a single device, we now split tensors over multiple devices. And it's tensor parallelism that really enables us to use such large language models. Now a quick word on XLA, JAX, and TPUs. These three items in combination are big facilitators of state-of-the-art large-scale machine learning engineering. XLA, or Accelerated Linear Algebra, is a domain-specific compiler for linear algebra. It pre-compiles code to accelerate models with nearly zero code changes. It works by fusing kernels together to optimize computations across models. JAX is a Python framework which uses XLA to compile NumPy-like code. It comprises of automatic differentiation, vectorization, and parallelism into one single package, and is a very efficient toolkit for machine learning. TPUs are an accelerator hardware device. XLA is optimized for TPUs, meaning that XLA runs extremely fast on TPUs. Therefore, JAX also runs extremely fast on TPUs due to the fact that it's XLA compiled code. I'll now pass over to Suraj, who will talk more in detail about how we used XLA, JAX, and TPUs for deploying Bloom. So to do tensor parallelism using JAX, we use something called PGIT. PGIT is a JAX transformation that can automatically transform your functions and partition it such that it can run on multiple devices. And the big advantage of PGIT is that you write, as a model author, you write your modeling code as if it's running on a single device and then let PGIT take care of sharding it and running it across multiple devices and multiple hosts. And the way you do it is you just provide the PGIT with your function and then you specify sharding annotations which specifies where to shard each parameter tensor along what mesh axis. So you provide that for your input parameter and your output values, and then PGIT by lowering your function to your XLA computation and can shard it across multiple devices. The way your PGIT works is that first, we need to pass it a device mesh. A device mesh is some just a simple array of devices and then you can reshape it according to the way you want. So this is how a single TPU V3.8 looks like. So we have eight TPU cores and then we can divide this into a 2D array. And for one array, we denote it as a data axis and for other, we denote it as a model axis so that we can do 2D parallelism. Then to actually compile our function, we pass the function to PGIT and then we specify the in access resources and out access resources. So this partition spec here specifies that the first axis of the input parameter will be sharded along the data axis in the mesh and the second axis in the input parameters will be sharded across this model axis 
and same for the second value and in the out axis the output result is also sharded the same way the first axis of the output tensor will be sharded along the data axis and then the second axis will be sharded along the model axis and we just need to provide this partition spec and using this partition spec pgit can actually shard your input and output parameters and do the distributed computation so to actually shard the models what we need to do is we need to provide this partition spec for each of the parameter in our models so for example in a transformer model transformer model we typically have an embedding a self attention ml mlp block and position embeddings so we just provide this partition spec for each of those tensors which specifies where to shard those tensors now when you are actually pgiting a function you can also provide intermediate sharding annotations these these are used for something like uh, activation sharding or gradient sharding so here this is a simple function which also which takes in in axis and out axis resources and it also has this with sharding annotation line here which shards the intermediate results according to this partition spec using that you can shard your intermediate activations right so this is all what we need to do model parallelism using jacks so what we do is we assign some logical names to our model axis such as batch depth or features or mlp hidden and then we add some intermediate sharding constraint to do activation sharding and then when we are actually sharding the model what we need to do is provide these logical access binding rules so what these specify is that where to bind the input logical access to which mesh access so here the batch access will be bound to the data access in the mesh meaning the batch will be sharded across data devices and the depth access will be sharded or is bound is bound to the model mesh which means that the depth or the hidden dimension will be sharded across the model parallel devices now so specifying the logical rules this way allows you to choose switch between different model parallelism strategies very easily without rewriting your code for example if you want to do data parallelism you provide this kind of annotations so where the batch is sharded across the data devices and the rest of the access for example the mlp the attention heads and the vocab dimension has sharding annotation done which means those are replicated so these rules will replicate the model across all devices and do data parallelism now if you want to do 2d parallelism like both for for example both data and model parallelism together we just provide this annotation where the batch will be sharded across data mesh and the other dimensions in the model will be sharded across the model dimension so specifying these axis rules will shard the will allow you to do 2d model parallelism and you can go even more advanced and do fully sharded 2d parallelism where you shard each each of the parameter axis and also the intermediate activations so here the the first four annotations look similar but then we also shard the embedding dimension along the model and data axis so this is a fully sharded 2d parallelism uh, logical axis that we ended up using for deploying bloom now to explain how did we uh, actually deployed it and orchestrated between different dp host i will hand it over to sanjit so this figure represents an array of tpu hosts in this case four so each tpu host is a separate tpu v38 device and we have model parallelism and data parallelism communication across these TPU devices. So what we can see here, we can represent as our TPU pod, so multiple TPU devices. In order to orchestrate these different TPU hosts, we need a separate driver virtual machine. This virtual machine establishes a remote protocol communication between each, between each of the TPU hosts. As machine learning engineers, 
we wanted to make this process as hands-off as possible. So we turned to Ray. Ray made it very easy to orchestrate our TPU hosts through simple Python class definitions. This meant that on our driver VM, we only had to run simple Python scripts and were able to bypass using bash scripts to execute the same commands over TPU hosts. To build this into a front end, we used Flask and a Hugging Face demo. The user first submits a request to the Flask app, which then transfers it to the driver VM. The VM then assigns the batch batches of prompt data to each of the TPU hosts. The hosts run the computation in JAX and return the result to the driver VM. The VM then communicates this result via Flask back to the Hugging Face front end. Through this, we were able to build very efficiently and quickly a nice looking Gradio demo, where inputs denoted here in white were requested by the user and the outputs here in pink returned by the model. And we can see here the true capacity of the blue model. Uh, it's creative aspect here on the left, being able to create a poem in the style of Alfred Edgar Brittle based on just a title prompt alone and also its computation abilities and more scientific approach here on the right, being able to complete a maths exercise given two addition prompts. So we put a lot of hard work in into deploying Bloom on these TPU hosts, and it required a lot of state-of-the-art engineering and a lot of um, figuring out how to scale code up to very large language models. And our job was made easy through the use of JAX, Ray, and Flask. Uh, but we want to limit the number of people that have to go through this process again. So in the hung face of style, we fully open sourced all our code, the modeling code, the inference code, and the deployment code. Uh, we hope that this helps the community and anyone who wishes to launch large language models in the future. We have example scripts to reproduce our benchmark runs. And the scripts are easily modifiable for any other TPU hardware and models. Thank you very much for listening to our talk on the deployment of Jack's Blue.